Good morning, and welcome to our online worship service from the Community Presbyterian Church here in Mount Side, New Jersey, on this Sunday morning, August 9th. I bid you greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. Before our worship service begins, I would like to take this opportunity to draw your attention to just a couple of announcements. First of all, we have learned that Evan, Evelyn Keller has passed away, and we've learned from the obituary that was in the newspaper that her family has decided to have a small, private burial service. We ask that you please keep her family in your prayers. Our guest preacher this morning is Reverend Dr. John White. Dr. White, we'd like to thank you for being with us this morning. There being no further announcements, I would like to ask that we now turn our attention to the worship of our Lord. Our call to worship comes to us responsibly as an adaptation from Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name. Let us make known God's deeds among the peoples. Let us sing to the Lord, sing praises to our God. May our hearts seek the Lord and rejoice. Seek the Lord and the strength of the Almighty. Let us seek God's presence at all times. Let us worship God. Let us pray. We seek your presence, holy God. Break through all of our pretenses that we might feel the power of your spirit. Help us to feel the miracles of life that surround us. We praise you. We thank you. We bow in awe before you. As we gather in worship, we pray that our faith may be enlivened our trust deepened, and our commitment expanded to meet the challenges of these days. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Our first hymn today will be number one, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
is Diane McCurdy, and I'll be reading the children's story this morning. Today's story is Berenstein Bear's Get Involved. Brother and Sister Bear belong to the Cub Club at the chapel in the woods. Preacher Brown was their leader. They did lots of fun things together. They went on picnics, played softball, sang in the chorus, put on plays, and painted pictures of Bible stories. But the Cub Club was about much more than just doing fun things. The real purpose of the club was to help others. There was always something that needed to be done around Bear County. Sometimes it was cleaning up Bear Playground. Sometimes it was bringing food to bears who couldn't get out and about. Sometimes it was even fixing up houses for folks who couldn't fix them up themselves. Brother and sister liked to be helpful. It made them feel good deep down inside. Preacher Brown explained that it was always a good thing to help those in need. As the Bible says, he told them, whoever is kind to the needy honors God. So the Cub Club went right on helping others all over Bear County. Little did they know that very soon their help would be truly needed. On the way to school one day, brother and sister noticed the sky was going very, very dark. By the time they reached school, it was starting to drizzle. Through the morning, it rained harder and harder. It rained so hard that recess had to be canceled and they had to have a study period instead. Rain, rain, go away, recited sister. Come again another day. But the rain paid no attention. It came pouring down harder than ever. I think you made it worse, said brother. When school let out, the cubs splashed their way home through the puddles. But then they heard a car coming down the lane. It was Mama. She was coming to pick them up. Thanks, Mama, said the cubs. We were getting soaked. At bedtime, brother and sister could hear the wind howling and the rain beating against the window. It was a little spooky, but they snuggled down under their covers and soon drifted off to sleep. They dreamed about rushing streams and roaring waterfalls. That's it for today's story. We'll be back next Sunday to continue the story about the bears. Our scripture lesson today is from the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, chapter 37, verses 1 through 4, and then beginning in verse 12 and following. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is a story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Silpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report on them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than the other of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Continuing in verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he went, so he sent him from the belly of Hebron. He came to Shechem and the man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, 
what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. But when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, that long robe with sleeves, the one he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as we begin the message, I want to bring you greetings from the Princeton Theological Seminary, from the students, the administration, the board of trustees, the faculty. We are indeed 
delighted to be in this ministry with you. And also, I want to give my congratulations to your pastor, Anastasia, of course, one of our graduates from Princeton. And we just are so delighted to hear about the birth. And we share that joy with you, with Anastasia, and with her husband. Friends, let us pray. Great God, we ask that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts will always be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Let the people of God say, Amen. Friends, there has been a commercial out there during the season of the coronavirus, and it asked a simple question. When we make it through all of this, and we will, what is the first thing that you hope to do? Now in the commercial, they provide you with some possible answers. Visit that special restaurant. Take that trip. But then they lead you to the preferred answer, which is to spend some time with those who are closest to you friends, and family. And they always seem to show folks smiling and hugging. Oh, what a wonderful image. But if truth be told, it is one that does not always strike a positive chord for each and every last one of us. Yes, there are those occasions when families can surely nurture us. And then there are those times when those who are closest to us may indeed challenge us, irk us. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. I am mindful of this one radio talk show to which I frequently listened during my years at seminary when I was in Pittsburgh. The title of the show was Amplify, and it was hosted by a local Catholic priest. On this particular day, the guest was a psychologist, and the topic was family dynamics. The guest, whose name I simply cannot remember, recalled the conversation that he had with one of his clients. No names were given, privacy rules. But at the end of that client recounting his specific situation with its fair share of drama, the client simply stopped and said to the psychologist, oh my, I think that my family is dysfunctional. The psychologist then chuckled and responded, guess what my friend? Every family is dysfunctional. And I tell you the truth. That one phrase has guided me through ministry more than many of the books that line the shelves of my office. My friends, we all have some stuff that we are dealing with. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen in this virtual world. But that being said, I think that we can safely add that the patriarchs of the line of Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's sons had considerably more stuff than most of us. And unlike all of us, their stuff is outlined in a book that also happens to be the most widespread publication in the history of the world. I'm talking about the Bible. You see, I was raised in a family where the matriarch refused to share or allow us to share anything about our family with the outside world. And here we find Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's sons stuff out there for all the world to see. However, However, I am convinced that we can learn something from the movement of God's guiding spirit, even in the midst of the madness. 
A reading of the text would have us to understand that the father Jacob, also renamed Israel, had a hand in setting this family dynamic on edge. He had bestowed upon Joseph the designation of being the favorite son. Joseph was given this long flowing robe, the one of many colors. This Joseph would dare to dream that he would be the greatest from among his siblings. And then, and then he had the arrogance to share these dreams with them. Now one dream had him and his brothers binding sheaves in the field. His sheaf stood tall while the others gathered around him and bowed down. And the other dream was even more presumptuous. The sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing to me, so he said. The second one even incensed the father who responded, what kind of dream is that? Does this mean that all of us, including myself, your mother, and all your brothers, and I'll add, and your sisters are to bow down on the ground before you? Now, it is not a stretch to say that we can understand that Joseph would not last long in a game of patriarchal survivor. To a large extent, I get mad every time I read this story and I did not have to share the tent with Joseph. I think that the feelings of jealousy and even hatred are accentuated in larger families. How many of you were raised in relatively large families. Raise your hand in this virtual world. And how do you feel when you had the impression that your parents played favorites and you were not that favorite? Now, my mother had eight siblings, eight, five sisters, three brothers, and she still gets mad stomping mad when she reflects how her youngest sister was given preferential treatment. And my mother is in her, I'm not going to say the exact age, but uh, she's close to 90 now. And that sister, the youngest, is well over 70, and my mother still gets mad about the way things were. But no matter how angry we are tempted to get, it is quite another thing to take the extreme actions of the brothers of Joseph. And thus we return to our passage, where we are told that Joseph was sent by his father to be with his brothers. He gladly went wearing that long flowing robe of many colors. When he came into their view, they plotted to kill him hoping that he would then be devoured by animals. Then let's see what will become of his dreams, they said of one another. Reuben, the eldest brother, appealed to them, saying, let us not take his life. Let us throw him into this pit in the wilderness. They stripped him of that long flowing robe, that one with many colors, that one given to him by their father, and they threw him into the pit. Now it is here that we come to the part of the story which in my humble assessment makes this one of the most heart-wrenching passages in the Bible. For it is here that we are told that after they threw him in the pit, they sat down to eat. That's right, after they had first conspired to put him to death, after they had stripped their own brother, then they threw him in the pit and they sat down to eat. Now true, Joseph had not endeared himself to his brothers, but had he deserved this? And we should know this, that the pit that pit into which he was thrown was not that far from where they decided to dine. They could have heard his voice crying for help, but they went about their business of eating. 
they took care of themselves. As I was preparing this message, I was reminded of a song by a band called Sly and the Family Stone. Yes, some of you may remember that band from the 60s and 70s. Yes, that band that performed at a farm not too far away from here in New York State in an area called Woodstock. This one song has the title, It's a Family Affair. Some of its words are as follows. One child grows up to be someone that just loves to learn and get this part. And another child grows up to be somebody you'd just love to burn. You have to think about how they felt about that member of their family. It's a family affair. So what is the relevance of this biblical story for you and for me? You see, that is the way that we should approach scriptures, not as a history book, not as a novel, but as a source that can speak to our very souls. Perhaps it asks us this most basic question, how do we treat our sisters and our brothers? Do we desire to turn away when they say something that offends us or challenges us? Do we choose to ignore their cries for help? Perhaps we are faced with this most poignant of questions. Do we even care about them? Or are we the ones who would prefer to throw them into the pit and sell them into slavery? We may find ourselves estranged from members of our families and feel relieved that we never have to see anyone in that crazy brood again. In the wider family of our community, we may choose to ignore those who are somewhat different from us in terms of age, in terms of appearance, in terms of income or perceptions of importance, in terms of their national origin or the color of their skin. They cry, but we, motivated by pride and or by fear, prefer to simply eat of the goodness that we have received. We may choose to feel paralyzed by the enormity of the task out there, so we may shirk back and do nothing, which essentially is the same as, as those brothers those brothers who sat down to enjoy their meal over the cries of their own brother in the pit. In our passage, the brothers attempt to cover their tracks by selling their own brother into slavery and by placing goat's blood on the robe that they had stripped off his back to cover the lie that they had concocted to tell their father. Just how sad is that? Yes, it's a family affair. It's a family affair. But my friends, the overall lesson to be found in the scriptures is that God never forgets the people of the covenant. Members of the beloved family of the divine are never forgotten. God's love is steadfast. You see, jo Joseph's fall from his brother's favor culminates eventually in his rise in Pharaoh's court, becoming the second most powerful person in all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. And eventually this Joseph has to provide for his family and for that land which has adopted him. Friends, God had a purpose for Joseph and God has a purpose for us. No matter how grim the picture may appear to be, there is always hope. And there is that hope as we live within the larger family of God. You see, our God takes heart-wrenching pains and makes them into everlasting gains. 
All glory be to God this day and every day. Amen and amen. Our final hymn today will be number 14, For the Beauty of the Earth. let us pray. Great God of life, we thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning. We thank you for allowing us to take that breath of life. And great God, we thank you for the new life that we have in Christ Jesus. As we are thankful for so much, we know that there are challenges in this world in which we live. We know that there is this political strife that we simply cannot shake in this country. And we pray that there may be a time when we can all work together. Because there are so many needs out there. We see so many who are hungry in our communities, in our world. We see people in food lines like we have never seen before. Folks needing help with their rent. Individuals unemployed. Great God, heal this world in which we live. Great God, we pray. Yes, we pray for the people of Lebanon. Specifically in the city of Beirut rocked by that explosion. Help us to indeed reach out to them. Heal those who are injured. Comfort those who have lost loved ones. Great God, be with those who are still recovering from this past week's storms. 
which caused flooding, which caused individuals to have damage, which caused some loss of life here in New Jersey. Great God, help us to be about your business. We are facing these unprecedented times with the coronavirus. We pray for those who are on the front lines and we pray for the researchers who are looking for a vaccine. May indeed we work together of one mind, of one heart, be with this congregation, that community, that even though we're not together physically, we are together spiritually. Great God, we come together as your people and we pray together that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as he says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, go forth to love and serve the Lord. Never return evil for evil, but combat the power of evil with the greater force of that which is good. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion that we share in the Holy Spirit be with us this day and every day, and let the people of God say, Amen and Amen.